everyone's still awake, even though we lost an hour of sleep. And, and Pat was so generous to point out that if you look at the back clock, I got like two hours I have to keep you guys here and still not go over. So thank you. Really appreciate Joan playing for us the service. I know a lot of times we complain about the whole daylight saving shit. Oh, Francis. Oh. Oh. Anyways, I know a lot of us complain about the fact that we lose an hour of sleep. But you know what it actually does? It allows you to get up earlier and be able to appreciate the sunrise. And I have to say, this morning I was able to get up early and I was looking at the sunrise. It was gorgeous. I mean, nice dark purples, and then it became the, the pinks, and then the flame and orange, just the brightness. And, and that's just the creation that's that gorgeous. Can you imagine what it's going to look like when the Creator actually returns in the splendor of the glory? Anyways, glad you're with us this week. And welcome to those that are watching at home. As you can look around us, there's, there's the virus, you know, some colds going around. And so, you know, my family, the kids, they're, they're at home right now. But there's others, too, that are not here just because they want to make sure that they don't want to share the love too much. Yeah, or, or, or maybe, we, maybe they forgot to set their clocks, too. Thanks, Ed. Uh, at the beginning here, we have a couple of announcements to make. One of the announcements is uh, Don Corbin and Diane Batter are going to start up the nursery. And if you're interested in helping out at all with the nursery, go ahead and see one of those two. Uh, the volunteers would be greatly appreciated. And Malachi is not that horrible to take care of. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> also, if you would like to have some chairs, and there's also some tables, if you're one of the individuals that came forward for, uh, and requested the chairs, go ahead and grab them today, or see Randy after the service to make arrangements when to pick those up. And then real quick, after the service today, for the board members that are here, we can meet real quick in the library just to discuss something and set a date for a, a future board meeting. But other than that, anyone have any other announcements? Yes, thank you. Yeah, today is the last day to order like Easter lilies or you know flowers in memory of our loved ones. Okay. So the last day to order, and if you have any questions with that, see Diana as well. If you have any questions, just see Diana. She got all the answers. <laughs> okay. If you would stand with me, please, as we go to the Lord in prayer. great day. I hope you came expecting great things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, your mercy, your grace. Father, we come here because we want to worship you. We have a desire to draw closer to you. Just help us to shut out what's going on in the world around us and just to focus on you. Prepare our hearts for this service this morning. We love you, Father. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let's just take a moment real quick to quiet our hearts before the Lord. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see each one of you here today, and we trust that, as Brother Luke said, that you came with your heart ready to worship and praise his holy name. Uh, let us take our bulletins and read the call to worship, if you would, please. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. All right, let us take our hymnals and turn to page number 100. Uh, if I don't look like Todd, it's because he's at home sick and uh, he could not make it today. And he called me last night and asked, or yesterday, I guess, and asked if I would... Uh, take his place in leading music, and so that's what we're doing today. He picked the songs out, and so we're going to go ahead and sing them. Number 100, Thou Art Worthy. I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we worship and praise his holy name.
page 526. 526. And if you're not using your book, you can just turn your attention to the screen. It is nice to be able to look up and not have to be looking down and read the, the book. But whatever. Okay.
appreciate that song. As we come before the Lord with this list of prayers that we have, I first have to say, it is really good to have Amber in the service with us this morning. And there is a praise there that we can say how God's touched. And then right there is just a living witness to God's goodness to us. So it's really good to have you with us today, Amber. But as you look at this list, it's, it's a lengthy list. And there's lots of physical concerns. Uh, Bruce Bennett was mentioned how he has a physical need. And now, Charlie. I have some updates on how Charlie is doing. <laughs> Yesterday, I was talking to the, the nurse's station at the ICU, and he was supposed to get out of the ICU yesterday. And they're moving him to just a normal floor today. And the plan is that later on this week, they're going to move him to like a, a rehabilitation center, nursing home, just for some quick rehab. Yes, Larry, do you have any more update? Well, he's out. Okay. They drug him out of the ICU. I mean, they let him out of the ICU. <laughs> right.
know is Dave Corbin? I'm going to try not to take too long. My heart's pounding, so that's going to mean I'm going to cry. So, um, I've asked this church many times to pray for my grandkids, and they always have. <coughs> and the Lord's always answered prayers. Um, last couple weeks, my grandkids haven't been here. They're not sick. My grandkids need prayer again. Um, it's not important for my daughter to send my grandkids to church these days. Um, there again, God's always come through, and God's always allowed me to bring my grandkids to church. Um, that's not happening these days now. It's weighing me down. It's weighing me down bad. Um, I was praying the other night, and it's weighing me down. I'd like to praise God and thank all the people here for praying for our granddaughter Amber and uh, she's doing well and she went through a lot but God brought her through it and, mm -hmm. and he had it all planned from the beginning yes. so it's uh, just wonderful Amen. and we're Amen. very grateful to everyone who prayed for her. so good to us. We thank you, Father, for the forgiveness. 
forgiveness of our sins and for Christ who died on the cross for us, who made a way to restore a relationship, a right relationship with you. And Father, how you now ask us to bring our requests to you. You invite us to come before the throne. And Father, you see this list. There are so many physical needs, Father. We think of Bruce and, and Darlene and, and, and Judy and Terry. Father, the, the list goes on for all the physical needs. Individuals are hurting. And we just ask that right now you would just come down and that you would touch them. You know each and every concern that they have. We just ask that you be with the family members, give them support. Be with the doctors and the nurses. Give them wisdom. Well, Father, we praise you for how you've been answering our prayers. We think of Amber, how she's standing with us today. Yeah. Father, after after that significant accident and, yeah. and the surgery of the rule, Father, you're just so good. Yeah. We praise you for how you've answered prayer requests. Father, we think of Charlie, yeah. Yeah. how he was in the ICU yeah. and how things were not looking good. But God, yeah. but you answered. Yeah. Amen. And we praise you for the prayer. Praise you for how you've answered and how you're dealing in his life physically. Father, and how you're reaching out to his family. Father, we thank you. And, and even talking to the nurses in the ICU, they knew there was something different about Charlie. And we praise you for that living testimony. And we just ask that you continue to touch him, Father. Continue to touch him as he recovers and as he goes through the next couple phases to get back home. Help him to be that light to those that he comes across. Father, right now we just think of Ben Kays and Bobby and, and their daughter Sherry. Father, I just ask that you would just touch Ben right now. Touch his lungs. That he would be able to catch his breath. That he would be able to breathe easy. Father, that once he goes to the doctor's appointment tomorrow and on Tuesday, that the providers would see that you touched him already. And that you healed him and restored him. Father, I just pray that you be with Bobby and Sherry. Just give them a peace and a comfort as they're taking care of them. Just draw close to them, Father, that they may draw close to you. Yes. Father, we lift up those that are grieving. We think of Dave McDowell's family and Andrea Smith's family, Father. I just ask that you give them a peace. Just touch them. Yes. Father, that somehow glory to you can be given in these situations. Father, we pray for our nation. Father, our nation seems to be confused, and it's only getting more confused. Father, we just ask that your truth would prevail, that men and women would step up in leadership, Father, that, that our administration would sense the truth that comes from you and you only. Father, that there would be a, a, a return to you. We saw the revival started over in Asbury, Father, I just ask that you'd help us not to just be spectators. But Father, help us to be those who are getting involved with the movement. Those who, who want to participate. That we wouldn't be just content with watching it and saying, wasn't that good? Wasn't that nice? But Father, help us to dig in and draw close to you and have a desire like never before. Just please may it be so. Father, we pray that you be with Gary. Father, he just got this news. But Father, we know he has a right relationship with you. And so Father, I just ask right now that you would just touch him. Yes. Amen. That Father, right now, wherever he is at this morning, that he would sense your divine presence with him. And that you give him encouragement and knowledge that your will and your perfect will will be accomplished in his physical life. Father, we rest assured in that. And we know that he does as well. Father, we praise you for Gerald and, and the procedure that he had done and that we got the good report and, and that he is recovering. Just as he expedite the recovery. Father, the others that have the physical concerns going on. We just think of Dave who just had the stroke. 
just touch them as they're figuring out what exactly is going on, what caused it. Father, I just ask that you touch them and restore his physical. Yes, man. Restore his physical being, that he would not be affected. And draw close to him. And Father, this one, Ashley, who's getting ready to have this extensive procedure coming up. I can't imagine, but Father, you already know that it's going to turn out, how it's going to turn out. I just ask that this individual would be drawn close to you, that you would see her through. And now, Father, we just come before you with this urgent request. Father, you know Crystal's grandkids. Father, you know the need and the situation that this family is in. Father, we've seen, as, as Crystal's testified to it, We've seen how you've touched and worked in this family before. Yes. And Father, it's when we reflect back, we see how you've moved. And it gives us the courage and the hope and the faith to know that you can and that you will do it again. Yes. Father, we are praying in your will. Father, we are praying according to your will. And we know, God, we have faith that you will move in this situation. That those kids will be hearing the gospel again. That, Father, your spirit will be moving in their hearts again. Father, that they would come back into the sanctuary. That they would hear the truth. That they would be a light to their immediate family. Father, I just pray that you would be with Crystal and Ray. Give them encouragement. May they just sense your presence with them as they are praying about this earnestly. And Father, I pray that you would help our church to have this prayer on their heart this week and next week. And Father, that maybe next week we can testify again to your goodness and your praise as they grace our sanctuary again with their presence, Father. We pray and we believe that it's your will. And we know that you can accomplish it. Father, be with all those that are lost, that need to have a relationship with you. Our family, our loved ones, our friends, you know there are so many that are on our hearts. We just ask that you would soften the hearts of those, that you would tear down those walls, those barriers. Father, help us to be a light to our community and our friends. And God, we give you the glory and honor and praise for everything you have done, for everything you will do, and for everything you are currently doing in our lives. We love you, Father. All these things we ask in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. 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 Maybe see. I truly have a testimony this morning and praise the Lord touching me and helping me through my last test. I guess the fact that, you know, we've already had cancer, we're pretty nervous, you know, when you go to get the test again. So I just praise the Lord. I just feel like he's had his hand on me my entire life. I do appreciate him this morning. He's been so good to me. So he has given me a clear uh, report this time. So I really appreciate it. I'm having throat trouble, so I'm see if I can get through this. <laughs>
what the runners used to do in order to get good grip is they would literally dig a little hole in the ground, get their feet ready, that way they can get off to a great start. Because if you don't have the proper footing, as soon as you start running, you're going to be slipping and sliding. Because you're not going to have that traction that you need. And it allowed them to get in that right position, that right stance, where they can just spring off. It'd be like a springboard. It's them going in the right direction. And if you don't have the right starting blocks, well, it'd be like this. Our living room is pretty large, and we have a lot of laminate flooring. And the kids and I make my wife nervous because we like to put on socks and just go tearing around, running and slide, and see who can slide the farthest. And, and well, needless to say, sometimes if you're wearing socks and laying on the floor and you try to get running really quick, next thing you know, boom, face plant. And then the father laughs at the kid because it's cute. And meanwhile, the mom's in the back are going, no, don't do this. But if you don't have the right starting blocks, that's what happens. You get ready for this race, and next thing you know, boom, we go face first. We stumble. We fall. So it kind of had me wondering, <coughs> what is our starting block? What is our starting block? Now, as you see in the bulletin, I got four points that I want to go over. And I decided, I remember as a little kid growing up in church service, I always loved it when the pastor would actually tell us how many points there were because I was able to count down. Most of the time they didn't tell us there's three points, and so it's like, okay, he's on his last sermon, or last point, thankfully. You know, point A, B, and C. But sometimes there was those pastors that had point A, B, C, D, E, F, and it just kept on going. And those are the ones, as a little kid, I remember going, Mom? But don't worry, there's only four points today. But this starting block, what is our starting block? We all agree that we need to have a good start. But what is the starting block? The first three points are going to tell us what it's not. So the first point. The starting block is not the world. <clears throat> See, remember, a starting block is something that's going to give you a good foundation. So when you take off, you're not going to fall and slip. The starting block is not the world. If you look in your scriptures, in your Bibles, to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. First John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. It says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. See right there in verse 16 it says, the lust of the flesh. See, that means focusing on fulfilling the physical desires. The loss of the eyes. Materialism. Gotta have more. You see, we see this a lot of days in like a lot of business executives. They're always like, if I just had more, if I just had more. Or, you can even go with the pride. When it says the pride of life. Some people try to have as a foundation this strive of being self-important. But you see what's wrong with that is as it says in verse 17, I believe it says, the world is passing. It's not firm, it's not solid. How many times have we heard about these big CEO executives or, or business executives when their business collapse? They lost their footing. They put all their trust into the world, but they lost their footing. The next thing you know, they're stumbling. They do with a face plant on land and flooring. <laughs> because they put their trust, they used the world as their starting block. 
Titus chapter 2, 11 and 13. Kind of highlights on this a little bit more, too. This is for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Remember those worldly lusts, the lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Verse 13 says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to come back to verse 13 here in a couple of points. But here, the Bible tells us this isn't a good foundation. This is not a good foundation to be on. starting block is not the world. Our starting block is also not people. Sometimes we look to others <coughs> for a firm start, for a firm foundation. Now I'm going to have this phrase up here and I'm sure many of us would be familiar with this. O you of little faith, or King James is, of ye of little faith, O ye of little faith. You see, a lot of times we will look to individuals for a firm foundation. But there are so many places in the New Testament where Christ is talking to his followers, those who are closest to him, but they kind of let him down in a way. He would make this remark, O you of little faith, or O ye of little faith. I'm just going to read a couple real quick. Matthew 8, 26 is when Jesus is calming the sea. He says, but he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. You see, right now we have those 12 disciples, those that are the closest followers of Christ. And they were terrified. And they're like, Do you not care if we despair? They woke him up. Don't you worry if we, if we die? And he's like, You of little faith. See, the disciples, they didn't get it. Another, Matthew 14, 31. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? This is in regards to Peter walking on water. I didn't do it. Uh, Matthew 16, 8. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? You see, here, this is an interesting one. The disciples were not understanding Christ's teaching. See, Christ was teaching about the eleven of the Pharisees. And so they were thinking when he was when he was here, when the disciples were hearing the teaching, they were just thinking of the physical bread itself. They weren't grasping the further spiritual understanding of it. And so once again, Christ answers back to them, Oh, you of little faith. And then in Luke 12, 28, real quick one, it says, If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Once again, God's followers worrying about provisions. And he said, No, don't, don't worry. So it's not people, because people have their downfalls. A lot of times, people in today's society will hear a motivational speaker or hear an evangelist that they really appreciate, thinking of the clergy. And if they put all their hope and all their, their, their foundational trust, now hear me out, if they put all that into that motivational speaker or to that particular evangelist or clergy, and that clergy member ends up falling, or that motivational speaker ends up falling. I've seen it where those individuals are devastated. The people that relied on them so much are devastated because they put all their foundation on that person instead of where it should be. 
they put their starting block, they had that individual as their starting block. And then now you take that starting block away. And the congregations, the individuals, they stumble. They fall. It's not people. Jeremiah 17, 5-6. It's pretty specific. It says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in a desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, which is not inhabited. Matthew Henry puts it this way. He says, He who puts confidence in man shall be like the heath in a desert. That's a shrub. A naked tree, a sorry shrub, the product of barren ground, useless and worthless. Now the key is he who puts confidence in man. We'll come back and talk on that a little bit. So when we're talking about the starting blocks, who we put our foundation on, it's not the world, it's not the people. It's not ourselves either. See, there's a common thought out there and I'm sure some of us have heard this phrase before where you can't trust anyone but yourself, right? So you can only trust yourself. Rely on yourself. Let your heart guide you. Let, let, let your mind guide you. A lot of times, that's meant in a good way. And what does your heart tell you? One slight problem with that. One, one, actually, not slight. One major problem with that. Jeremiah 17 9 says this. If you're already, I, I did a lot in Jeremiah 17. <laughs> Jeremiah 17 9. Here's a slight problem with what does your heart tell you? The heart is deceitful above all things mm. and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You see, a lot of times we hear that saying, trust your heart. But you see, We're still in that carnal state. Our heart is deceitful. Who can know it? Well, verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. So we don't know what our heart is saying. But if we are surrendering it to Christ and to the Lord, He does. <clears throat> you see, according to the Bible, the heart is the center not only of spiritual activity, but of all the operations of human life. At our core, God didn't design us this way. He designed us to have a relationship with Him. But when sin entered the creation, at our core, we're deceitful. And I've seen this so many times. I've seen it so many times where we make excuses for the wrongs that we do. Right? I think, of, I think of it this way. When I'm telling my child, hey, don't touch that. They're deliberately touching something. I'm like, don't touch that. What do they do? They do one of these things. Oh, they're stretching just so they can touch it, right? <laughs> because they're making it. But they're making the excuse, well, I wasn't deliberately touching it. I was just stretching and touching. They're deceitful. And that's a child who, who hasn't grown up to, to learn how to be deceitful. They're just naturally deceitful. The heart is deceitful above all things. Once again, Matthew Henry, I love how he puts this. The heart, the conscience of a man in his corrupt and fallen state is deceitful above all things. Now, listen to how he writes this out. It describes society. It calls evil good and good evil. It cries peace to those whom it does not belong. Yeah. The heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately wicked. Who can know it?
turn into your Bibles to Mark 7. We'll look at verses 15 through 23. Some people would say, well, that's Old Testament. New Testament has come. Only problem with that is, Mark is in the New Testament, and Jesus pretty much says the exact same thing right here. If you have a, you know, red letter edition, you're going to find that most of these words are red, because Christ spoke it. So, Mark chapter 7, verse 15. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, Pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile man. That's so hard to think, because you think of that little precious child. And you think of all the evil thoughts that are here, the, the, the evil that was just listed here, proceeds evil thoughts. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So, our heart can trick us. Our heart is deceitful. So when we say, starting block, can we rely on ourselves? can't rely on the world. We can't rely on other people. Most certainly, we can't rely on ourselves. I've been a part of a couple different like studies where they would have you do like a, a performance review. And you would have to rate yourself on how you do, right? And I've been a part of groups, and of course, you have to fill one out for yourself. And then you have to fill one out for each individual that's part of your group. Here's the funny thing. A lot of individuals think of themselves way up here. <laughs> and then when others rate them, and then also there are cases where it's vice versa. Some individuals will rate themselves way down here, and others will rate them up here. But the thing is, we have a biasness of ourselves sometimes. A lot of times we make excuses, like I mentioned before. Our heart will get us and, and, and make excuses for us. Kind of, kind of like what Satan did to Eve. Do you remember that? Satan, he, he, he just got in there and he's like, did God just tell you that you would die? Did he really say that you would die if you ate that fruit? Did he really? That got Eve thinking like, That's not what he meant. See, our heart does that. So we can't trust that. So what can we trust? You see, our only starting block is this. God. That is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And His Holy Word. You see, by definition, the starting block was supposed to be something that was fixed. Something that would give them traction. Something that they would get aligned to in a proper foundation. So as they get ready to run, we wouldn't give way. The world, it's slipping away, it's passing. It's not a permanent fixture at all. People, people are fickle. 
You can't trust them. Ourself with the heart of God and His holy word. That is what our starting block needs to be. We need to be focused on God and His holy word. You think of it, Hebrews 13.8 says this, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. That sounds permanent, pretty permanent right there, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3.6, For I am the Lord, I change not. That's that you can't really mess that one up. I change not. Amen. You see, Jeremiah 17, once again, I told you Jeremiah 17 is very popular with this. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 says this. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Not whose hope is in the Lord, but whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when he comes. But its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Once again, verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is is the Lord. I, I love that. I, lo I love that. Whose hope is the Lord? Because, you see, that word hope in the Greek, or excuse me, in the Hebrew was mitta, and it means confidence. Whose confidence is the Lord? It also means reliance. Whose reliance is the Lord? And trust. Whose trust is the Lord? That means they are fully founded on the Lord. Blessed is the man Whose hope is the Lord? For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters. You see, we think of all that worldliness, you know, we think of all the, the materialistic needs, and people will put their foundation and hope in the needs, the, the, the materials. But the Bible doesn't say. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's Matthew 6, 33, and then Luke 12, 31, the exact same thing, just different wording. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. You see, seeking God's kingdom first, having him as those starting blocks, he'll take care of you. He will take care of you. Amen. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. <clears throat> I hope I don't confuse some of you on this. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. reads like this. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Wait, wait a second. Luke, I thought you just said that people were not the foundation. Didn't you just say that people are not your starting block? But yet, we just read it right here, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. You're, you're, you're mixing things up. Well, true, if I stop right there. But, verse 20 says this, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You see, this is how it works. When you're building that foundation, that cornerstone, when everything used to be built out of stones, some of it still is, but when you're building everything out of stones, you had that one stone that had to be set perfectly. It was level, it had to be squared perfectly, and everything else was built on top of that. That was your one true foundation. After you built the house, if you pulled that cornerstone, whatever structure it was, it would come tumbling down. So those apostles and those prophets were built on top of that cornerstone. So when I say people are not our starting block, that is true. People that of themselves is not our starting block. But if an individual has a starting block who is set on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ and his truth, that 
as an individual we can look at. So if you see ministers today, and they are preaching something other than what's in the scripture, they're not built on a cornerstone of Christ. And I'm telling you, I hate to say this, but it's out there and it's popular. A lot of times we hear in the scripture where it says that people in the end times will go to hear what tickles their ears. They want to hear something that makes them feel good. But you know what? Sometimes not all medicine tastes good going down. And sometimes the truth hurts. But does that mean it's not true? No. You see, we need to make sure that we are founded on the cornerstone of Christ and His truth. One last scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. It's going on more of this idea of Christ, our cornerstone. And Him as our foundation. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. Peter says, Coming to Him as to a living stone, Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer a spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion the chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, you could also say, but to those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. <clears throat> they stumble, being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You see, right there, that stumbling block, that cornerstone, Those that have those, those starting blocks set on Christ, they're not going to stumble. Those who have Christ as their cornerstone, they're not going to stumble because they have a firm foundation. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, right? So those that don't have Christ as the rock, those that don't have Christ as those starting blocks, when it's time to run, when it's time to take off, it's just going to be like those socks on the laminate flooring. They're going to stumble. They're going to do a face plant. It is so important that we have it. That we have the right starting block. He who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. I never ran in races. But I guess one of the most humiliating things for a runner is if you're at the beginning of the starting line and that, that pistol, the starter pistol goes off and you take off running, and next thing you know, you're on the ground because you stumbled. Meanwhile, everyone else is running dead sprint, sprint, uh, sprinting away, and you're still trying to get up off the ground. <laughs> we need to make sure, as a church, we have the right starting blocks. We need to make sure God and His Holy Word is our starting blocks. You see what's happening so much these days is this. God, His Holy Word, has become an item of convenience. What I mean by that is, if I have time, I'll read some scripture. Or if I have time, I'll pray. 
or if something else is going on on a Sunday morning that I'd rather go shopping instead of going to church or, or something else comes up and I'd rather do I'd rather do this than attend the Bible study it's become this item of convenience and so when we have that race and we're at that starting block how sure is our foundation so I encourage us as we get ready to start this adventure, and I'm speaking to myself too, let us make sure, let's get back into the habits of putting God and His Holy Word first in our lives. Let us set apart some of that time where we can get into His Holy Word. Let us set apart that time where we can have a good season of prayer. Because that is how we get to know Him and His Word and His will for our lives. Amen. It's just like this. In any dating relationship, if you're dating someone and you didn't communicate with them, would you start questioning, hmm, does this person really love me? Think of it this way. If you're communicating, if how you're communicating with God is the way your significant other was communicating with you, what would you think? Would that be a relationship that you wanted to be in? Or is that a relationship where you're going to start scratching your head and saying, hmm, something's wrong? That's a good way. That's a good litmus test. Are we spending enough time with Christ? Because I'm telling you, God loves us so much. Those last two verses that we just read in, in, in 1 Peter there, where he says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 10, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You see, that's a callback to the book of Hosea. When Hosea married Gomer, who was a harlot. God was using that as an example of Israel. Hosea married Gomer, who was a known harlot, had some kids. And then Gomer went on ahead and abandoned Hosea again to go back into the life that she was previously living. And God said, this is what Israel's doing. But go back and redeem her again. Redeem her. And so Hosea had to go back and purchase her. Because she was being sold as a slave. And so Hosea got Homer back into his family. He redeemed her, brought her back. And they had more kids. And that's where the saying, because when he named the kids, it was first named, who once were not my people. But then the next child that was named was basically named, Now Are My People. Who once had not attained mercy, the next child, have attained mercy. See, that's what God has done for us. We shouldn't take it for granted. God desires such a relationship with us. It's hard to fathom. So as we get ready to start on this adventure together, let's continue to draw close to God. Amen. Yes. Let's continue to build upon a foundation with Christ as our cornerstone. Yes. And I tell you what, when we do that, God's going to use us like we could never even imagine. Yes. Let's be a conduit for the Holy Spirit. Let's be a vessel that Christ can use. Remember how I said Titus 2, verse 13, we're going to come back to? Remember, Titus 13, or 2, verse 13 says this, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is what our focus needs to be on. Let us stand this morning. I'm excited. I can't wait to see how God's going to use us. 
get myself in trouble because I get thinking at home. I'm like, God, this is going to be awesome. I have to I keep myself. I have to be like, okay, okay. God first. Come on, God. You, you, just, you just do it. You just want to be a vessel. I hope that's the same prayer in your life, is you just want to be a vessel for God. Yes, amen. We've got to make sure we have Christ as our cornerstone. We can't have the world. And I said we can't have people, because oftentimes, sometimes, individuals do not have Christ themselves as a cornerstone. In yourself, you've got to have Christ as your cornerstone, amen. your foundation, your starting point. Bow your heads and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for your goodness to us. Amen. Father, we thank you for how you have redeemed us, how you sent Christ down the cross for our sins and brought us back into your family. Father, that we are adopted sons and daughters. can't even imagine and understand how you loved us, even, even though while we were still sinners, but yet you did this for us. We praise you and we thank you for it. Father, we come before you, and we're getting ready to start this adventure together. Oh God, we come before you as a congregation and make this claim that you are going to be our cornerstone. That we are going to keep you first and foremost. Father, help us to draw close to you. Help us to get into your word. To see what you want us to do. Help us to know your will for us. Yes. Reveal yes. your will to us, Father. Mm. Give us that understanding. And Father, give us the encouragement and the strength to walk in your will. Father, just help us to examine ourselves right now. And if we have a foundation that's built on anything but Christ, anything but your holy word, anything but you, reveal that to us. Father, we want to be built on the truth. Father, we love you. We just want to bring glory to your name. We want to give you glory. Father, I just ask that you put a hedge of protection around every individual here spiritually and physically. I know there's a whole bunch that are down with a virus and the colds, and I just ask that you put your hand upon them, that you just touch them, even while they're at home right now listening. May they just get over this cold, and that they can come back and worship you with us. Father, I just ask for your blessing upon this congregation. Help us to be a light in the community around us, at work, to our families, at Walmart. God, when people see us, may they see you in us. Help us. Guide us. We love you, first and foremost, above all else. When we ask all these things, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 You're dismissed.